Who used to be known as the Fat Controller, but since he's lost four stone, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the call of that. <laughs> He's now the medium sized controller. <laughs> Not the same ring. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed, all enjoyed your breakfast. I shall now call on our guest speaker, Andrew Lansley, the Right Honourable, oh. <laughs> Leader of the House of Commons, Lord Privy Seal. Thank you very much, Bob. Thank you very much. Um, and Member of Parliament for South Cambridge, which is most important in this context. Thank you very much. Um, do call us Right Honourable. They, they, they generally, when they say that, say, um, but you have to remember that you're not necessarily honourable and not often right. Um, <laughs> it's a bit like this thing of Lord Privy Seal. I said, well, what, what, I'm not a lord. But, uh, um, I'm not a seal, or at least. I mean, uh, and I kind of hope I'm not a privy. Uh, <laughs> but I tried to find out what being Lord Privy Seal actually entails. It's been around since 1350 or something. As far as I can see, it, it consists of... She gives you the seal, she, Her Majesty, gives you the seal. You put it in your safe, and when you lose your job, you give it back. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit like, the seal is almost like a P45. <laughs> um, no, I am, I am, you're Member of Parliament, um, if you're in South Cambridgeshire, which I gather from your um, short introductions, you pretty much all are. Um, some of you will realise that uh, not only do Sally and the family and I live over in Orwell, but we used to live in Melbourne. Uh, in Little Lane in Melbourne, so uh, uh, we know, for example, uh, a few opposite folks. Where I live. <laughs> Is that right? I'm opposite where you used to live. <laughs> well, it was lovely living there, and uh, we very much enjoyed it. It's only kind of a, a growing family that meant we couldn't stop in the uh, in in in, uh, in Little Lane. It was lovely, uh, but it did give us the opportunity, not least, to uh, to visit leeches on a regular basis. <laughs> I could do. I could do the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or, or I, or I'll tell you this though. I do remember when I was visiting leeches back then, and, and I looked at. There's a thing that the um, um, that the government produces through the the um, meat hygiene inspectorate called a um, a has score, which is a hygiene score on abattoirs. And I remember looking at this thing. And uh, th the best in the country was leeches of Melbourne. <laughs> <laughs> top, top, top men and women they are there. Um, so, um, but anyway, from my point of view, what, what I want to talk about briefly, but, um, but then give you a chance perhaps to say a few things to me as well, because one of my jobs is to represent you. And what that means, I think, is uh, I need to know, and it's helpful to know from you, some of the things which uh, are most important to you, some of your frustrations and... Um, and, and obstacles so that we can try and support you in business. Because from our point of view, you know where we are as a country. We were, we've got ter terrible debts. We've got to earn our way out of this. You can't just carry on. You can't, you know, the response to having too much, even the financial advisors amongst us will say, unless you've got some fantastic investments, um, if you've got a shed load of debt, the thing you can't afford to do is to carry on borrowing because that way lies disaster. You've got to earn your way out of it. And we're on the earn-out at the moment, and it's long and it's tough. It's very difficult. The government isn't spending more than we plan to spend, but the revenue isn't yet coming in, and we're getting an awful lot of international trouble. Um, and, uh, but earning out is about, sometimes it's about big businesses, it's about, you know, like TTP and earning in the international marketplace. You'd be amazed how many businesses that start with a local perspective rapidly are able to go um, regional, national, and international. Remember, the, the business that succeeds is the business that can access the maximum number of potential customers, which, of course, means it depends on the character of your business. But for many businesses, um, exporting is absolutely essential if you're going to get uh, to all the customers that you want to get to. Um, but different businesses have different requirements. And what we need to do is to make sure that we can support all of those businesses as best we can. What it does mean is... Uh, and I can remember, because uh, before I was mem a member of parliament, I was uh, deputy director general of the British Chambers of Commerce. So in a, in a way, you know, the getting together of the business community is a thing that I've been involved in for many years. And I do remember, mostly when we talked to the business community about what they wanted from government, it was for government to get out of the way. It was the amount of regulation that was coming in and, get, and causing a lot of time and difficulty and cost. Well, we've been trying hard. Over these last two and a half years, we've actually cut the cost of 
regulation to business by £350 million in total. Well, £350 million sounds like a big number. I'm afraid this is probably less than 1% of the total cost of regulation to business. We've got a long way to go. So really what we've done so far is we've stopped it growing, but now we've got to try and bring it down again. And uh, there may be a few amongst you who say, well, hang on a minute, uh, it doesn't feel quite like that yet. Uh, and one of the reasons is because actually half the regulation we uh, have on business in this country comes from the European community. And, of course, we don't control that to the same extent. And we can't stop that and reduce it in the same way unless we can get others to come along with us. So that's part also of what we have to do over these next uh, uh, two or three years, is to get that new settlement with Europe that allows us to say to Europe, no, there are aspects of regulation which actually are getting in the way of um, Britain and Europe being able to compete internationally. We've got to reduce that too. But for small businesses, businesses with fewer than 10 employees, we've got the uh, exemption. No new domestic regulation on new businesses till April 2014, a three-year exemption. So you should be able to say, look, if somebody's saying to you there's a new regulation, you should be able to, to uh, um, say, no, I'm a, small, I'm a small business, I have fewer than 10 employees, you shouldn't be doing that. I mean, in health and safety, as you know, there's the April this year, there's the new exemption coming in. Brilliant. Um, yeah, made so, it so much easier. Right, so we've got a few of these things, we need more. So suggestions in terms of getting uh, that. Those of you who are doing accountancy will know that for small businesses, quite a big reduction in the extent to which small businesses are having to file accounts in the same way that they used to have to do. So cutting back on regulation, absolutely essential, and it's always useful to know what are the regulations that clearly, from your point of view, get in the way, serve no purpose. Second thing is, you have to have access to finance. I know it's Steve, isn't it? Uh, um, hey. Our banker, well done. Uh, <laughs> I see Barclays here, I can remember when we were fighting to keep Barclays in the village. And those days are unfortunately gone. Uh, the, um, but, uh, you know, access to finance, it's, it's a real frustration. And you've probably heard us saying, look, hang on a minute, we're, it feels like we're pushing on the proverbial piece of string. You know, we keep, the bank keeps pushing money out there, the government's put money into the funding for lending scheme, and still, actually, lending to small businesses isn't going up. So what's that all about? Why, why, what is that happening? And, the, and people from the big banks will tell you, well, actually, it's because we've got to build our balance sheets, we've got to put money away, we've got to kind of build up our capital, uh, so it's very difficult to take on risk and everybody's become risk-averse. Well, unfortunately, risk is the business we're in. If you don't take risks, you don't prosper. Um, there, there's no such thing, frankly, is there, as a safe business. I remember when I was with my, um, one of my friends at the Chambers of Commerce, we were going to visit about uh, 15 years ago, 20 years ago probably, um, we were visiting the Department of Trade and Industry. And um, <laughs> he went there and he, and he sat there at this meeting. And the civil servants... I can say this because I used to be one of them. The civil servants were sitting there explaining to him what small businesses ought to do. And he kind of came out of this thing. Uh, and we were going down the, the street afterwards and he started to berate me and said, oh, no, no, no. If, they, if they get it wrong, he said, um, they mostly get pushed sideways uh, or occasionally promoted. If I get it wrong, the car goes, the house goes, the children's future goes... Everything goes. They don't understand. They, I take the risks. And it's that mentality, you know, that's what business is all about. And that mentality is one we have to understand and support. And that business, including, frankly, from banks and the new banks coming through and the business for the finance for lending, people have to understand that you can't walk into uh, an office um, with the banks and say, look, you know, I'm taking a risk. And they say, well, we're not supporting risk. Risk is what you have to support if we're going to succeed. Um, so export is important and the UK uh, TI, we put a lot of support now behind UK TI to work with um, the Chambers of Commerce, in particular my old friends at the Chambers of Commerce are trying to get, so we've got more support for trade missions, more support for uh, understanding what the uh, international markets look like through market research internationally and so on, uh, and um, supporting through export credit finance when people are going abroad. We've got to cut regulation, we've got to support finance. Um, but most of all, we've got to uh, think about getting the skills through, I think. Because when you look at most, when I talk to many businesses, what they say is really makes the difference is that they've actually got the, uh, the, 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 particularly the young people coming through, the workers who've got the skills and the attitude. 
And I'm delighted we've got the Village College here this morning because I think actually that relationship between the business community uh, and education is absolutely vital. Um, and it's not just the actual skills, although that's important, you know, the ability to, you know, to, to add up and write a, a decent letter or email, you know, to be able, but actually it's the attitude. It's the fact that youngsters will turn up in the morning, want to learn, be disciplined, do the job, uh, and frankly, most businesses I've talked to, when, when we had that period of kind of lots of people coming in from Poland and Eastern Europe, and I said to companies, why, we've got young people who are unemployed, why are you not employing them? You know, we've actually got what are they, nearly a million young people who uh, are, are not in work and looking for work. Uh, and they said, well, actually, it's fundamentally, it's attitude. Because we train, and there is support. There's apprenticeships, there's traineeships coming through, there's lots of skills opportunities. We would train people if we were absolutely confident that they had the right attitude, that they would stick to it, that they would do what you ask and be there and were willing to learn and to adapt. So that relationship with young people as they come through, I think, is absolutely critical to make that happen. Final thing I want to talk about is locally, of course. Um, and they say in politics, all politics is local. And in a way, all business is local, too. If you haven't got the infrastructure, how can you really make it all work? You need, you need broadband. You need roads that you can actually drive down and hope to get where you want at the time that you want to. Uh, you've got to have... Um, a railway system that works fantastically. Thank you very much, David. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> as, a, uh, as a commuter out of voice, it's got to be, it's got to be, hasn't it? I'll, I'll say this. I, no, no, uh, you know, first capital connectors, you know, I travelled to London and, it, and the, la the course of last year, I think, you know, I must have done it however many hundred and something times. Uh, and I, probably in 99% of times, it went fine. Mm. There was the one occasion <laughs> when I was going to the cabinet meeting that the Queen was coming to. <laughs> Murphy time, wrote a law about first it. First time it? since Queen Victoria that Her Majesty had come to a cabinet meeting. I'm down at Royston. Like I'm from Orwell. I'm down at Royston and it's ten past seven and it's quite a bad day but they say, get on this train. <laughs> I became insufferably familiar with Letchworth Garden City. Because <laughs> <laughs> the lines all went down at Hitchin, you remember that, don't you? Yeah. Uh, that was a bit of a shocker. I've tried to forget it, but I do remember it. <laughs> a bit of a shock. So, if, but you do, you rely upon it, don't you? You rely mm. upon the infrastructure, and even more so if it works a hundred times and then it goes out the hundred and first. Um, but getting that infrastructure right, and you know what we need locally. We do need that broadband, and last Monday was the, uh, the County Council announced the um, contract to BT to be the providers for connecting Cambridgeshire and I guess uh, I hope some of you have been kind of joining up for that uh, to say that you want to be broadband your customers for this but what we're looking for is across the whole of Cambridgeshire I think something like a 90% uh, super fast broadband coverage by 2015 so that will make an enormous difference because I know you know on a, in the evening if because Sally my wife uh, runs a business from home and if she's you know during the evening in particular, if she's trying to do research or something, or, or send documents, it just drops out, because yeah. everybody comes home and they're all on, and the capacity isn't there, and it's only two megs in the first place, and then you try to keep dividing it up as more people come on. Just can't work, we can't be like this. We're, we're a European, international center around Cambridge, and in South Cambridgeshire. We've got to be one of the best places in the world to do business, um, but actually, we can't really support businesses properly in this modern age if you can't be sure that you've got really fast broadband access to get you anywhere in the world um, when you want to want to get there. So that's what those are some of the things we're aiming for. You will have other things that, from your point of view, you think are important for me as your member of parliament to be pursuing. Um, the other me, as leader of the House of Commons and Lord Privy Seal uh, in the cabinet, you know, we collectively are trying to do. Some things are good. Some things are still. We've got a long way to go fact is in South Cambridgeshire today compared to the general election there are fewer people unemployed than there were at the last election. Um, in 2011 there were more new businesses set up in this country than at any time um, since uh, records began. So there are some thing, good things happening but it's awfully tough uh, and for those businesses that have started up in the last couple of years you know what it's like it's the first three years that are toughest 
to grow, to prosper, is going to need, at some point, it's going to need finance, and it's going to need government getting out of the way, and it's going to need more skills if you need to employ somebody. So the things I'm describing, we need to make sure they're there, and they're there to help you when you grow. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrew. That was really good. Now, it's sitting there. <laughs> this is your opportunity. Question them. <laughs> Tina. I have problems with the Foxton Crossing. Oh, I'm sure a lot of other people do. Any idea what's going to happen there? Yeah. Um, there is a long history. Um, at about uh, 12 or 13 years ago, we, get, we began a programme of trying to get a deal done between um, ourselves, the, the county council, the local authorities, uh, and Network Rail to put a bridge over the Foxton Crossing. Um, fact of the matter is, we didn't get there. The money wasn't there. It kind of dropped out in about, I think that plan disappeared about 2006 or 2007. So at the moment there is no plan. Um, but someday we're gonna have to do that thing. It's quite an expensive project, unfortunately, because you can imagine that the land is there. You could do the land on the, uh, I'm heading there looking, hang on, east-west, get that east-west right. Well, on the opposite, Barrington. yeah, on the Barrington side of the, the land is there. You could do it, um, but it's a, it's quite a big financial project for Network Rail to do. Um, but we, you know, we'll tackle those things one by one. We're we're going to get the Ely Southern Bypass done, which will hopefully get the railway and the road separated south of Ely, which is like this. But that was getting to the point where it's almost going to be something like 48 or 50 minutes in the hour that the traffic wasn't. Mm -hmm going through it. At, at Foxton, it's bad. What are we, two, 22 minutes in the hour or something like that? Yeah, so it's got, it keeps going up. So we've got to do something about it, but we've got to get the money out of Network Rail, to be perfectly honest. But it would make a big difference. I mean, the finances for Network Rail, of course, it's a big upfront cost for them, but they would no longer have to have uh, somebody in that signal box all the time at Foxton Crossing. So they would have a revenue, positive revenue flow from it. So we've not lost sight of it, but it's not unfortunately in the plan at the moment. Hi, uh, as we explained, we're, we're still into month two of being a machine mill. And I would say that when we were looking at our projections before we came here, one of the biggest barriers to us wanting to, to do this and set up this business was business rates. Um, they were astronomical. Um, and that's been. Hmm? More than that. Um, yeah, and it's one of the things that was pretty much the decision whether we do this or not. Um, and we hope to turn this into a really successful, profitable business. Um, but we know the first three years, as you said yourself, will be the most difficult times. Um, what plans are there, or are there any plans for new businesses to encourage them to set up, whereby there could be uh, a relaxed period on business rates, um, a holiday period or something, so that new businesses or new entrepreneurs like me and Serena uh, actually can get into business easier and quicker? Small business... Um in the, I, I was trying to, trying to find here because I remember George in the um, autumn statement extended small business rate relief to 2014. So if you qualify for small business rate relief, there is further um, uh, uh, opportunity there. Um, we need locally with the district council really, and the county council to have a conversation about how this is going to work because um, for the future, the increase, what's the, 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 the the local authority is going to be able to hold on to um, a significant proportion, I think it's pretty much 50% of the increase in the business rate revenue is going to be held on to by the local authority. Now you might say, well hang on, I pay all to the local authority. But in the past, if, the, if there were more businesses paying more business rates in an area, the area didn't benefit from that. It all went off into the central pool and then got redistributed out. And that's going to change. And 50% of the business rates are going to stay. The local authorities have been given responsibility for some budgets themselves, but they've also been given the 50% of the business rates. So they can see, if they can grow the business rate, they can decide what to do with it. And part of that needs to be reinvesting back into promoting new business for the future, because we can see that benefit coming through. So we need to have a local scheme for promoting uh, that kind of uh, improvement in business. But um, it's always worth, I mean, South Cairns, to be fair to them, it's, they've got a good business support operation going. 
you know, they're always willing to, to, to talk to businesses about um, what their needs might be. And they've got, in, as you can see, increasing flexibility in the future themselves to make decisions about what circumstances they apply business rates or they don't. The only thing they don't really effectively have a discretion in is the business rate valuation itself. Uh, HMRC and the valuation uh, people do that directly so as to make it you know, comparable, uniform, you know, effectively meant to be a uniform system of, of uh, independent system of valuation across the country. So it's well worth talking to South Cairns uh, direct about that. Um, I'd like to bring the focus back for a few minutes, back to Melbourne. Um, I don't know about the rest of you, but I personally think that the Melbourne Business Association is absolutely fantastic for us. But I think if it can put more effort into it in certain areas, it will help the village, both at family level, business level, any level you can see how to talk at. I also happen to know the three people to your left run this on a shoestring. So using your powers or whatever, is there any way you can help them? Please. <laughs> well, to coin a phrase, join the Melbourne Business Association. I am already. No, 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 I'm uh, coining your phrase. Um, no, it's a very good thing to, to support. And I must say, from, you know, I know from the, you know, over the years, both inside the constituency and from working with the Chambers of Commerce, they, uh, which of course now incorporated the Chambers of Trade more or less just after I was with them, we, we um, uh, did that deal. So I think Royston came in to the Chamber of Commerce movement when the Chamber of Trade came in at that time and so on. Uh, and, um, and businesses getting together is good for businesses because it's about networking, but it's also very good from the point of view of um, councillors and local authorities and members of parliament because it, it enables these voices to be put together for there to be somebody you can go and talk to, somebody you can come to, uh, and have an opportunity to, I mean, how would I, you know, I, I do know some of you, but how would I have this opportunity to kind of hear from, from all of you collectively if it wasn't an association making that happen? And it's true in all walks of life. People who organise things are the minority and they put their time in, whether it's parish councils or church organisations, you know, we all live in a... You know, party uh, party associations. We all live in a minority where you know you might have a thousand members, but you know you have about fifty people who do the work. Mm -hmm. So, but being the members is important. Coming to things is important. Being willing to spread the load a bit is important because, like in all these things, actually, once you once you have a few more people who join in, actually, the load to any individual then really isn't too bad at all. So, I entirely endorse what you say. So. One of um, the government's flagship policies is to try and build our way out of recession in this country. And I keep hearing how planning restrictions have been relaxed. Um, Sally and I have been trying to build a house opposite here for around mm. about two and a half years now. And my experience of um, applications to South County <coughs> Council, I mean, recently an application went in and it took a little bit longer than it should have done from the point of admin but they have a policy of trying to turn around applications in eight weeks. But because it got to the end of that eight week period, and because of government guidelines that things have to be processed in eight weeks, they automatically rejected it and said, you've got to reapply, um, which obviously cost me money in terms of architects fees and what have you. Um, but what exactly are these planning restrictions or what, what's been eased to try and help people build the way out of recession? Um, I mean, obviously, if you want to put a conservatory on or uh, I don't know, a porch or something, I, I understand what um, restrictions have been lifted. But mm -hmm. what sort of major policies have been, um, or red tape has been removed to, to actually help developments? Yeah. Well, I'm sorry that South Cams did, did that, because they, you're right, there are um, some government-directed um, di uh, targets about processing applications within a period of time and not letting it take too long. And you shouldn't seek to go get round that by rejecting uh, applications and not dealing with them properly in the time that's available. Although I must say, if they rejected you under those circumstances and you went to the inspectorate, the, the inspectorate would yeah. take a very dim view of the yeah, well, grounds. We, we were advised to withdraw it. Right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> <but it's>, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it is. It's it's tough this stuff because we talk about localism and we kind of give, uh, and 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 that's a practical thing. And I think. Um, one or two folks here have been involved uh, in the uh, parish plan, 
And of course, taking the parish plan and now turning it into the, you know, under the new legislation, turning it into the neighbourhood plan, actually will mean that it's not just something that the parish kind of has worked together to give a, an expression of view about. It's something that will have statutory backing. It will be a plan-led system. So the parish can directly take a, um, a, a view, and that view will form part of the planning system for the future. Um, but generally, at the same time as we're trying to give more power to the local authorities and the parishes that you, you vote for, um, the government is, you're right, very keen to get more housing built. You know, we know we've got uh, 1.8 million people who want, who want to or are on the waiting list for social housing. I know locally I've got three times more people uh, who are contacting me about trying to get into social housing locally than I did 10 years ago. So we've got to build these houses. South Cambridgeshire is that sort of place. We, we know we've got people coming in who want jobs. We've got jobs and homes required. We're going to have to build probably between 1,000 and 1,200 homes, new homes a year in South Cambridgeshire to keep pace with uh, those requirements. So working out now where those should be, but 100 and something, 200 of them a year are going to be opportunistic. They're going to be people who've just got a plot and just want to kind of build something. And we've got to enable that to happen which is why the legislation, the Growth and Infrastructure Bill going through Parliament in the Lords at the moment, uh, is, is about freeing up these things. It's about permitted development rights being extended. It's about uh, a stronger presumption in favour of development coming through in the planning system. So, the, you know, it should genuinely be true that unless there is some good planning reason for you not to build a home, you should be free to do it. So that's the way the assumption should work. So. But all of these things, you have to kind of look at the merits of any individual case and you have to kind of work it through. I just say, you know, from my point of view, I'm always available to help because I'm not part of the planning system. I don't take planning decisions and so on, but I do, so therefore I'm free in that sense to kind of get, you know, alongside constituents and try to make sure that in this respect or any other, you know, the bureaucracy doesn't get in the way when it shouldn't. Going off on that point, though, yeah. is, uh, that's just a single planning. There's a big thing in the village at the moment when you're driving around and seeing all these signs. They're talking about building 300 plus houses on the road out to the 505. Oh, right, yeah. um, Rumour has it that that's just the start of the thin end of it, that there may be as many as 1,400 dwellings being built. Um, and, and the question then is about when you talk about infrastructure, how is that going to be supported? That road will become very busy. It's already a dangerous road, especially with the primary school. Um, have we really got any say in, in, in actually having that stopped or reduced or having well, any Well, now is the moment, because where, where we are at the moment, South, Cam South Cambridgeshire <coughs> has to produce what's called a local development framework. And in a plan-led system, the things that would, should decide what the um, shape of planning in any village will be in the future should be, firstly, what is in the local development framework and what is in the neighbourhood plan. And these two things should directly correspond. Now where we are, South Cambridgeshire effectively said, how many in their consultation last year, how many new homes do we need to build and where do we think they ought to be? And they've just published, yes they have, they? they've just published the next stage which is, okay we've been through all the possibilities and we're now winnowing right down and these are the proposals on which we're consulting. So now is the time to, because if you don't get, if you get the plan wrong, <coughs> if, if it says yes, there should be enormous development in, I mean, from my point of view, across the constituency, you know, there's, you know, Combaton don't think they can cope with it at all. Swayze think they can cope with it and they want some more. Um, Salston has always been difficult because actually it's quite distant from the centre of the village, but actually Salston has got a, uh, a local centre for shopping, so it is actually able to cope with. Um, some additional housing. How many of these should go into wholly new um, uh, settlements? So we have North Stowe, North West uh, Cambridge, and probably Waterbeach following on after it, and the question will soon arise, if, well, after North Stowe and Waterbeach, what then? And we look at places like uh, building near at the Abington and say, well, actually, that would drive Sawston out of business if you put a whole new town at Abington. It's not the right place for it. So there's a whole load of these things, but for Melbourne in particular, through the parish council and in response to the, to the consultation in the, um, the, the district council running, now is the time to decide that. I know from the, they're looking for Melbourne to be a growth village. They want Melbourne to grow. 
they see in Melbourne that there are transport connections, you can get to the railway, you can, uh, people can commute from here, you can get on the bus and take and buses. You can't get around the corner and go off and park there. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's, it's not like that. It's just little things like that. that well, I did live in Little Lane, so I do remember that one. <laughs> and how but the, the, if it's local for local people, then do they have a problem with that? But will it just be for local people? How many of it? I've, I've lived in a village before where they've done ex uh, extended development, and then they bring in the problem families from other areas yeah, to sort of split them up. And, and, well, and that has that. At the end of this year, we've got the influx of Romanians and, and <coughs> other Eastern Europeans. Will there be housing put aside, set aside for those that come here to work? Any sort of concerns like that? Well, basically, development in villages really uh, forms two parts. One is um, specific small scale local developments that are in relation to local need. So, uh, in Orwell, you know, from in the village, that, you know, there is a plan to have something on Hurdle Ditch Lane, which is close to the A603, but it's specifically a number of houses for people who are on the local housing list with connection to the village. But what is being proposed in relation to Melbourne is beyond that scale. So it is designed, as it were, for, to meet the needs of the district as a whole. The, meet the, the district as a whole is primarily employment related. It's people moving into the area for jobs. And therefore, to that extent, it isn't for you know, it isn't for any particular category of people. It's you know, people who have uh, needs on the social um, housing requirements. So there'll be thirty, a third, or forty percent maximum, probably, um, that will be social housing, and the rest will be for sale. And obviously, for sale, it's whoever you know, is is uh, best able to buy it. Um, so the question for Melbourne, and it's not for me to say, Melbourne should come forward and really together put this answer forward. Do we think we should take some? And there'll be businesses who say, well, actually, this is a good thing. You know, the more people who can access the shops in the village and the services in the village, the better it is. But where and how many? And there's a balance to be struck. And it's the villages, the village, if the village has a strong voice, a collective voice to the, to the district council, there's no reason why the district council shouldn't then listen to that. Because they, you know, from their point of view, they want to get, they want villages to develop who in ways that is consistent with people who understand the village best. But it does get that, you have to get that voice together. And now, but now is the time to do it. The expression affordable housing sticks in my throat a little bit, mm. because it seems as though affordable, the cheapest properties going up are around about a quarter of a million pound mark. Now, my daughter works in childcare. She works outrageous hours, comes at home absolutely knackered every night, and gets paid around about £16,000 a year in a good year. Her partner, and there are some CVs on the desk, um, if anyone can find a job for Darren, <laughs> you'll spot the CVs, please make a suggestion. He works for Budgeons, he's a department manager. He was the manager of a larger store in Cambridge, but that's by the way. He's also on about £17,000 a year. Their chance of finding a home are zero. There is no way they can save. There is no way they can afford a quarter of a million pound property. In Royston, I think the very, very cheapest properties are around about 120,000 for a one bedroom flat. So you've got an area like this where it attracts highly paid people. We're, we're a very prosperous area. There are a lot of people on very, very good salaries, but you also have an awful lot of people on very, very low salaries who, quite frankly, stand no chance at all of finding housing that they can afford. And, and I'm right in thinking that the average age of a first-time buyer is now about 38 years old? Yeah. Like that. Well, yeah. I was reminded by my daughter yesterday that the average age of a, a, a first-time buyer, she said, was 35. Um, I don't know why she'll tell you this. Since, since she's, she's, she's only 24. Uh, <laughs> and she was saying it's going to take an awfully long time to, to get there. Um, you mentioned um, South Camps yeah. and yeah, having discussions. <coughs> they did actually come to the village last year and talk about housing. Yeah. And they went away and concluded that 120 houses, with identified spots where there would be 120 houses. The latest idea, which was actually 270 houses, Actually, taking these two aside, which was thrown in recently, 
it wasn't. It was just an idea they came up. They gave less than two months to actually consult with the village. I mean, we're in the midst of the consultation now, aren't we? Yeah. yeah. The cynics amongst us think that that's just, you know, just to say that we're doing something, but actually, in fact, it's already been agreed. No, I don't think that's true at all. I mean, I, you know, in response to the first consultation last year, I mean, I went and spent an hour. I mean, you have to do this. You have to spend time doing this. I spent an hour with the chief executive and the um, director of planning at the district council, literally going through village by village. I mean, part of it, I have to say, just between you and the gatepost, is that, um, of course, there's not a, there's not a memory, a corporate memory in the in the in the officials, the staff at South Cairns. They don't know the villages as well as, uh, frankly, you need to in order to get this right. You know. Um, so it was quite interesting from my point of view, going through village by village and finding, literally, the planners sometimes they barely know the village. Mm -hmm. So what they, you know, they so they just almost have a, like a tick box approach. Well, you know, is it on a railway line? Has it got buses? Is there a shop? Is there a school? Is a, you know, if it if it ticks all those boxes, you push as many houses in as you possibly can because, by extension, their argument is if you don't have a school or you don't have any buses or you don't have any public transport, blah, 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 then you can't put anything in there. And then sometimes they miss things completely. The argument in Combaton is they took no account of the fact that when they, if they add any significant number of homes at this point, they'd have to completely redo the whole sewerage system because it's already at, over, at capacity. So you do have to go through this and you do have to argue these points uh, in order to get it right. But the point about affordable housing, I mean, the truth is that the connection, an awful lot of youngsters are not going to be able, under current circumstances, to buy a home for themselves at all easily. There's schemes out there, the first-time buyer schemes are very generous. We're getting back to a position, hopefully not dangerously so, where youngsters can buy a home with a 5% deposit and, and, and the mortgage rates are low. You know, the funding for lending scheme, which is pushing money into trying to go to lending, you know, the, the counterpart, the other side of the coin of there's not enough lending to small businesses, is that actually there's an awful lot of lending to, for mortgages available. And the price for mortgage lending has, if anything, come down. But you know, you've got to have you've got to have the earnings to back it up. It's, there's a there's a gap, and here we are one of those worst places in the country for the gap between people who are earning, uh, you know, just above the minimum wage, and the the price of property. And under those circumstances, you've got to be looking at, at renting in social housing sometimes for a substantial period of time. Yes, sir. The least example to be looked at in isolation because obviously the housing ladder is a, is a ladder, and Although the stamp duty rates are applicable at the kind of level of housing that uh, my friend's daughter and her partner are contemplating, nevertheless, they, the cost of stamp duty feeds into the, the cost <coughs> which then inflate the house prices further down. Yeah. Now, we are a company that employs well-paid people. We've got to scour the world to find cutting-edge scientists and engineers, and we've then got to try and get them to come and live in what is a high price area. We, as a company, tend to bear the cost of the stamp duty in order to help employees move here. Our stamp duty bill is enormous. On top of our national insurance. <laughs> <laughs> so these are half a dozen of small thank you, is it? Order, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a, crazy, it's a kind of crazy thing that we're actually exacerbating our problems of recruitment mm -hmm. and the general you know, local population's problems in buying a house. Because of, because of but you know perfectly well that actually one of the reasons people it come to Cambridge for two main reasons. One is because actually it has some of the most exciting technology businesses anywhere in the world and the LinkedIn University and all that goes with it. But at the same time, we actually have a really good quality of life. You know, Cambridge is a great place in, in itself. South Cambridge is, you know, you've seen it, the Halifax, whatever, did their quality of life index. We were top. Now that's pretty fantastic to be a place that's economically. Uh, almost at the top of the tree, and has a quality of life at the top of the tree. That's a almost, that is a unique combination. So, but we've got to keep both of those things. We can't. So, getting this planning thing right is really hard because it's uh, it's a real balance to be struck. Because if you if you overdo it, um, you ruin a village. You ruin the villages. You ruin the quality of life in Cambridge. Because basically, it's all about the city and the villages. It's not. You know, the, the market towns, we can do what we can, and Royston is building, and, and, but actually the villages are what actually bring the, the, the high 
earning individuals is what brings them here, is the villages. Yeah, and then back to that comes in, so as soon as affordable property comes on the market, the people who are cash rich buy it, it's no longer available to the people who could otherwise afford it, so they're now stuck with having to rent, <laughs> and you're running into that circle again. As soon as you're paying a thousand a month uh, to, to rent somewhere, you stand even less chance. Of course, I, I would but say in... in, in so all my kids live at home, and I'm going mad. Let's have a friends who move in. <laughs> <laughs> I would say, though, um, what is important from our point of view, one of the things that is important, because the levels of income you're talking about, um, one of the things that really is wrong is for, is, for, is for youngsters earning at that level also to be paying a lot of income tax. So actually, if you're earning at that sort of level, by this April, the income tax that they're earning will have been probably halved compared to what it would have been two or three years ago. And we're going to keep that try to push that along because you need to have the house of multiple Could I could I ask you to change the subject and talk about food fraud and food safety in the latest news. Um, I, I know you spoke about civil servants earlier and uh, not taking necessarily taking a hit when the economy is um, on on the rocks. Uh, I, I I wonder if you'd like to comment on the reduction in resources and powers of the Food Standards Agency with the, the this this latest news about uh, um, well, horse meat in yeah, yeah, processed yeah. food. Well, of course, until uh, September, I was Secretary of State for Health, um, which actually meant um, that I was also the Cabinet Minister responsible for the Food Standards Agency, because if you recall, way back in the BSE days, the, the then after BSE in 1998, the Labour government said um, the uh, Food Standards Agency should not be um, reporting to an organisation in the Ministry of Agriculture that is effectively run by the farmers and the producers. So it's there for the consumers. Trouble is, actually, all the evidence shows the Food Standards Agency, for good or ill, basically runs itself without regard to anybody. Uh, and it's not even really accountable through ministers in the way that it ought to be. Now, that's fine if everything's going well. But when things are going badly, it's not fine. Uh, and so actually we did see, <laughs> one or two people here might remember, remember the thing about de-sinewed meat? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and it suddenly became obvious that the moment, their moment trouble hit the Food Standards Agency, they needed us to go in to help to sort it out and to explain it and to communicate and be accountable for it. And the same will be true with this one. Food Standards Agency, we'll find out. I, at the moment it is, frankly, utterly depressing to find that there have been all these, um, all this evidence emerging principally in the first place from Ireland as a result of the Irish agency's activities, that now is beginning to illustrate that whatever it is the Food Standards Agency was doing was not illustrating that they found routinely whether what was on the packet was what was in the packet. And if you can't, if you can't be sure, it's all very well, frankly, I would say, saying, oh, but there's no harm to human health because, you know, it's horse meat, but it's, you know, the point is if you don't, if as a regulator, and indeed for that matter, if you're a big retailer too, if you don't know what's in the packet, you don't know what's in the packet. And that's very worrying. And that's why I think we do need to, you know, there is, we, and the, this, is how, this is how you end up with a lot of regulation. But I think everything, what we're doing on health and safety and so on and so on, is all about trying to find where is risk, identify where the risk lies, and do something proportionate in relation to that risk. Just the simple fact of random testing should, if these problems are as widespread as seems to be emerging, should give you pause and say, well, hang on a minute, we've got to have some random testing of products, and if there is a problem that continues, we're going to find out about it. And if, if somebody, you know, the nature of this, you have proportionate regulation, but if you find somebody's gone and done something wrong, actually you come down on them relatively hard. And people, but people who are not doing anything wrong, they're actually going to be fine and they're going to be left alone and able to get on with it. But it does feel, must feel, when, when you've got a meat hygiene inspector who have practically got, for everybody who's working, there's another person standing over them watching them. And then you find this stuff is happening in other countries and coming and being imported and, uh, you know, and 
it does ma it makes a mockery of the system, doesn't it? Because we've got clearly a, a a tight regulatory system in relation to the original supply chain in this country, but our retailers internationally are not doing it, and that's a real worry. That's why it's good having chaps like this, Ben. Yeah. Local laboratory, yeah, his local shop. Yeah, no, that's very important. Well, I have to say, and I don't, don't eat meat. <laughs> <laughs> It's quite a long time since, you know, frankly, from our personal point of view, we thought we would routinely buy meat other than from a local butcher because mm. actually, you know, you do know, you know what's there. Mm. Absolutely. And they're at Burwolf Man Barnes as well, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Coming in sin. <laughs> now need to marry us. <laughs> um, as you see, the next meeting is on the 5th March, and we hope you'll all uh, turn up just to see us, and even though Andrew won't be there on that one, unfortunately. But it'll just be little old us, and uh, we hope another to see you. Another interesting guest speaker. Yes, another interesting guest speaker. <laughs> and uh, we hope you'll, you'll all uh, turn up for that one. As Bob said, we all know that. This is the, the first anniversary, and I was just saying that um, a year ago um, we had exactly half the number in here that we've got today. So I think, you know, that's that's pretty good. It is thanks to all of you that, that turn up every month and put up with us and uh, put up with our, our learning curves because we don't know what we're doing. We do our best, but it is a learning curve. And uh, hopefully we'll see you in March and for many months to come, years to come. Thank you very much. Somebody just told me I didn't thank. I want to let me talk. Enough.